Forget the kangaroo, this is now our greatest national icon. And after 34 years, the Sydney Opera House has a World Heritage listing to prove it. It's officially one of the wonders of the modern world, alongside the Taj Mahal and the Acropolis. But let's not get too carried away here. The truth is, it's really a dud. It urgently needs a major overhaul. And if we don't spend big and spend soon, the pride of Australia could actually cease to be a functioning opera house. However, there is one person who can save it. The man who created the masterpiece. Paradoxically, the man we cruelly rejected in the first place. It's come to symbolise Australia. The Opera House is an epic piece of architecture that has changed the image of an entire nation. The very concept of the Sydney Opera House was a brave and ambitious project for the times. It was bold, it was visionary, it was youthful, and I think it really did something for the whole pride of Australia. No matter which way you look at it, Sydney Opera House is an extraordinary architectural wonder. An age only seems to have added to its beauty. Over the past 34 years, it has literally won over the world. But while it still looks grand on the outside, the same can't be said for what lies within. And many are worried that unless some big changes are made, this could cease to be a functioning opera house at all. This really does rank as one of the very uh, poorest opera houses in the world. CEO Norman Gillespie is passionate about his opera house. I think he was such a visionary. But says it simply doesn't measure up to international standards. Oh, very nice. I believe that if we don't take action now and completely rebuild this theatre, this theatre will be obsolete in a very short period of time. And I believe it would be a national embarrassment to have one of the greatest opera houses in the world not able to stage opera or ballet. Of course, it was never meant to be this way. We have an inferior opera house because we famously ran its creator, Jörn Utzen, out of town before he could complete his masterpiece. Were you a victim of politics? Yes. It's as simple Sim as that? Simple. Yes, it is. Utzen is now 89 and lives in his homeland of Denmark. He's frail and his eyesight is failing. He says this interview on what was the most difficult time of his life will be his last. Were you aware of the protests that took place in support of you for your return? But it was not possible. You just couldn't come back? No, I, I was uh, not given any possibility. What we are doing is to go through the entire Opera House, look at what can we do, where do things need to be changed. But now, after 34 years, Australia has done what was once unthinkable. We've asked Jörn Utzen to come to the rescue and finally finish the Opera House the way he always intended it to be. Remarkably, he's agreed. The Utzens uh, could be forgiven for going like this when they hear the words uh, Opera uh, House. But it's given us a lot of positive things <laughs> yeah. in our lives, I'm sure. Jörn and his son Jan, also an architect, have been commissioned to plan a multi-million dollar renovation and take the Opera House into the 21st century. These closely guarded designs are the first glimpse of what they have in mind. Also, uh, for instance, we got an opportunity to change the reception hall, which is now called the Utzen Room, which is nice, of course. It's appropriate, really. And uh, we <laughs> are so delighted because other jobs have come and gone, but the Opera House has always been there. And that a new generation of Australians have picked this up and brought my father back is a great delight for him. 
It's one of the great tragedies of the Opera House story. But since the day he walked away, Utzon has never returned to Australia and never laid eyes on the icon he created. You've never seen the Opera House? No, but I, I see it better than you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not want to go there and physically touch it? Oh, yes, of course, but I had, I had been uh, advised not to go by the doctor. Do you regret that then? I, I don't regret anything. I think he's seen it very, very clearly. In his mind, he knows every inch of this house. It's been with him all his life. As his uh, wife Liz said to me, it's his first remark when he wakes up in the morning when I bring him a cup of tea, and it's his last thought before he goes to sleep. This is his masterpiece. It was controversial from the start. Construction was constantly hindered by politics, and the people of Sydney were being told their opera house was costing more than they could afford. And there was, of course, that resistance against using so much money. So there were, I think, 75 days of strikes when I was there. So it was a, a building which was difficult to get through. Utzon clashed with the politicians, who simply didn't believe he could complete the project. They stopped payment. Amid a national scandal, Utzon resigned and fled the country with his family. Utzon is out, and the new team of architects is in. The signpost at the front gate to the Opera House bears precisely that message. Well, he was treated in a silly manner, in the way that I think Sydney and Australians would have been much better off had he been left to complete the job. Uh, it would have been much more beautiful inside and out and much more coherent had he been left to complete the Opera House. But when new architects stepped in, they changed Utzon's plans. The concert hall was built where the Opera Theatre was to be, and the Opera Theatre was relegated to a much smaller space. The thing is that they tried to put too big foot in a too small shoe, if you will. On stage, it's grace and glamour. When you're right out, we're right. But behind the scenes, it's a nightmare for performers and technical crew. Sets have to be cut down to fit the confined space and then have to be moved to an entirely different level at interval because there's nowhere to store them. Now, this is massive. This is pretty representative and, and sometimes you're literally putting it on the lift with centimetres to spare. It is that close to get these sets on. I mean, it's all smoke and mirrors, isn't it, really? Because I can see the wall just over there. It, it's one of the great illusions. So it, it looks pretty massive, a bit like Doctor Who's TARDIS. <laughs> Go behind that and really you're at the wall. But it also demonstrates there is nowhere to store any of these sets as they come off. They've got to move back down on the lift and out of this uh, area. So tight is it behind the scenes that ballet and opera performers crowd the corridors and struggle up narrow stairways to get on stage. The other issue is wing space when we're in tutus and there's lots of girls trying to get changed out of one costume into another. And in limited space that is a problem as well as people trying to move sets in scene changes and um, it's pretty squashy. And dangerously for ballet dancers like Lucinda Dunn, it can mean leaping off stage into the arms of someone employed to catch her. This is the wing. This is the non-existent and wings leads. It's really quite remarkable that there are no wings. This is when we get ballet dancers literally having someone to catch them. As they vault off, we have catchers or we have a mattress where they can crash into. OK, yeah. so you're on stage there. Yep. You're not here. here. And then there's the wall. Stage. But for the orchestra, it's truly ridiculous. Is it true that some of the uh, musicians have to play <laughs> with earplugs in? Yeah, they do. We've, ex we've experimented with all kinds of earplugs. Lack of space has squashed the orchestra pit under the stage. Opera Australia CEO Adrian Collette says that means noise levels down here are literally deafening. 
So much so that musicians must be routinely rested to protect their hearing. And the only way we can manage this for certain sections of the orchestra is literally to rotate them from performance to performance. And I compare this to sending Australia's first 11 onto the cricket field and at tea saying, well, half of you go home, we're bringing on the next slot. Yes, our timpani section is right up the back where they make the least noise, which is so far under the stage that they can see the legs of the conductor, but they can't actually see the baton. I shouldn't be laughing. I mean, this does sound like a comedy, but it's no, so it's deadly bizarre. serious. It's really it? bizarre. <laughs> Now it's going to take a monumental effort to fix these problems, but it can be done. By excavating the sandstone beneath us, this whole floor can be lowered a full level. That will increase the size of the stage by 70%, provide for more seating, and get the orchestra out of that dungeon. <laughs> When we came up with the idea that why don't we just lower the whole auditorium and the stage by one level and suddenly all that volume inside would be lifted. And that's when Utzon got excited because then he said, yes, I believe we can build a world-class theatre inside the existing shells. Do you think the interior of the Opera House is on the right road to being the best it can be? Yes, I, I think so. But it would come at a great cost, an estimated construction bill of $600 million. And much of that will have to come from taxpayers' money. It's the same arguments when the Opera House was being built or the Harbour Bridge was being built. But in addition to roads and railways and hospitals and, and, and houses, we need these great visionary projects to lift the nation's pride, to lift the spirit. And I think that's what the Opera House has achieved. So you've got to just bite the bullet and say, yes, all those things are important, but so is having a great opera house. Pattern, like a Spanish fan for ladies, is coming natural. For Utzon, it would be the vindication he has sought all his life. After the opera house debacle, Utzon's life was never the same. His reputation was tainted and his career stalled. But amazingly, he doesn't hold a grudge. You are now acknowledged as a man who was wronged. I think they shouldn't do that. They should do, they should forget about it. I'm too old also, so if you get involved in all these things, but I was so happy. I liked the Australians so much. Somewhere down deep, I suppose he's felt scorned that are you not good enough, or something like that. But when he was asked back, he then immediately said yes, because he, he was so happy that, that people from here uh, wanted him back. It's been a troubled journey, but perhaps at last for Utzon and his creation, that's all about to change. The wonderful thing about being an architect is to make surroundings for people which they like and love. And that was in my mind from the start. It's a truly unique building, isn't it? Yes, yes. And you did that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.